Amen. Praise the Lord for that wonderful time of worship and song. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we commit our time in the word to him. Please pray with me. Oh, Heavenly Father, you have moved on our hearts. As imperfect as we are as individuals, you have moved on our hearts to be here today. And we have come because we love you and because we want you and because we need you. We have come to worship you this morning. Pray that you would pour out your grace upon us in an amazing way, that it would abound towards us, that we might experience your peace and your joy in our hearts. Forgive us of our sins, O oh Lord. Take our burdens away that they may not weigh us down any longer, at least for this short period of time. I pray that you would lift us up and encourage us by your grace and by your presence, by your spirit in our hearts and our lives. Speak to us. Remind us of the truths of your word. Help us to decide, O oh Lord, that we will act and live for you. We glorify you and magnify you in all things. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, we want to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3 this morning. 2 Peter chapter 3, and we move into this final chapter, this final section in the little epistle of 2 Peter. He has been, he has been addressing false teachers and false prophets. He has come down pretty hard, and as we move into chapter 3, he actually brings together a number of the things that he has been talking about, and he zeroes in on a particular example or criticism or item that these false teachers, these false prophets have been focusing on. And so he asks a very pointed question. And as he is addressing this question and as he is responding to the critics, he reveals that God has a particular point, a particular purpose, a particular hope when it comes to sinful man. And it is this, that God desires repentance. God desires repentance. We find this in verse 9. It says, the Lord... This is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. He is patient. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so there it is, the will of God expressed for mankind. He desires and he is patient and he has not held back his promise except that he desires men everywhere to repent. And one of the things that we can take comfort and joy in knowing is that we are here this morning because we have repented, I hope, and we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have asked him for the forgiveness of sins. And so we walk in this will of God that is expressed in this chapter here. But nevertheless, there are several things for us to take up on this as we look at this chapter. So let me read the first few verses here. 2 Peter chapter 3. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So we have, a, we have a lot of things in these verses, and that brings us to our first point this morning. And it comes from verse 1. And the first point for us to remember is this. Be reminded to act. Be reminded to act. This is not the first time that Peter has said this, and so he begins this chapter, and he says again, this is verse 1, Beloved, I now write this second epistle to you, in both of which I stir up your minds by way of reminder. So you will notice here that when he says this, he is stirring up their minds, 
and wanting to remind them. He is stirring up their minds and he wants to remind them. And so this comes and brings us to the first point, and that is to be reminded, to allow ourselves to be reminded. That's why he is writing this. Now, uh, it is interesting as we consider what church is and as we consider what it means to listen to the preaching of the word, Peter is saying that he is writing his epistle not to teach them new things, although he does that, and the learning is a very big part of you know, what we might call education. A lot of times, however, we come to our sermons and we come to our Bible studies and we come to our lessons with the idea of, well, I want to learn something new. I want to learn something new. And that, that, that a lot of times is kind of our framework. But the part of church is not just about learning something new. It is about being reminded of things that we already know. And this, this uh, is the heart of what Peter is trying to do. By saying that he wants to stir up their minds and to remind them of these things, he is implying they already know them, they just need to bring them to their minds. And so while it can be mentally refreshing and emotionally refreshing when we hear something new, we have to be careful not to simply yield to our flesh's desire for novelty. And we want to remember that the truth of God's word is more than that. Um, I, I think our desire for novelty has come out in the entertainment business by the quickness by which one scene transitions into another scene. So if it doesn't go bang, 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 bang to something new, to something different, we disengage, we become bored, we, we just cannot connect or keep connected with it anymore. And a lot of times we kind of bring that wherever we go. And unless it just keeps on moving, unless we are taken from one place to the next, we just kind of lose our focus. However, when we come to the Word of God, it is more than just kind of being moved from one place to the next. It is about being stirred up and... Uh, being able to work. It, it's like you have a bottle of water and you have some sugar or sand or whatever in the bottom and it just kind of all settles down there to the bottom. So if you take all, if you take the sand that's in the bottom of your little water there and uh, you, you consider that your knowledge, what you need to do is, you know, shake the bottle up so the sand just kind of permeates the whole of, of the bottle of water, which is your life. So don't let it sit at the bottom. Shake it up and let it go through all of you. Be stirred up. Be reminded of these things. Allow yourself to be reminded. It is really important for this. So if we come not to look for the something new necessarily, uh, hopefully, you know, maybe we will get something new or to learn, we will learn something new or we will be moved emotionally in some place that uh, we haven't been before. Hopefully, or maybe that will happen, but the... the uh, one of the important things <clears throat> is that we are being stirred up and reminded to things that we already know to be true. Reminded to bring them to the forefront of our mind so that we can do something about it. And that brings us to our second point. And so we have to remember that what we are doing, what we do in the preaching and in the teaching is spiritual business. It is not an, an uh, intellectual exercise only. It is not meant to stir us up emotionally only, but this is spiritual business. The only way that we will truly be impacted by the truth of the word of God is through the spiritual impact first. And then the rest of it can follow. Now God can use our minds, God can use our emotions to do this, but he must carry the truth by his spirit to impact us with those truths spiritually first. If it never engages us on a spiritual level, it will not have everlasting or eternal or long-lasting fruit in our lives. So we can come to an example here. And if we look at uh, this verse in Luke chapter 8, verse 13, this is the parable of where the sower goes and he sows the seed. Luke chapter 8, verse 13 says, But the ones on the rock 
are those who, when they hear it, receive the word how? With joy. And these have no root, who believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. Do you see that? You can come, you can come, you can hear the word, and it really pumps you up. It really gets you excited. You are moved with joy, and you are moved with this, and you are moved with that, and you leave, and you, and you say, yes, what a great sermon that was. I was really touched by it, and it made me cry, and it made me jump for joy, and all of these things. But, if it, but unless it has taken root, it will have no impact on you. And so we have to be careful not to allow the emotional upheaval to be considered as that which is the most valuable. As much as we like it, it is not the most valuable thing for us. Because as soon as the, the emotional impact goes away, so does whatever we may have learned. It will go away also. And this is not just a, an emotional exercise. I mean, uh, this, is, this can be a mental thing too, because after all, what is Paul, Peter trying to do? He is trying to remind them. And why do they have to be reminded? Because their minds, what do we, we tend to forget. So we might be moved emotionally, and we, because of the, the weakness of our minds, have to be reminded but in the end, there must be this underlying spiritual impact of this movement of the Spirit of God in our lives for it to have long-lasting fruit. And so we have to be re reminded here that this is spiritual business that we are talking about. Spiritual business. And so how do we make sure that we are spiritually okay to receive the Word of God? Well, you know... It, we, we do some of these as we prepare for our, our uh, time together. We, we have time of prayer, and we're, we're asking God to forgive us of our sins, right? We're asking God to carry away our burdens. We are turning our attention to him, and we exalt him. We make sure that we're looking to him and not to all of the stuff that's going on around us. So we do some of these things. Actually preparing for church sometimes goes back to Saturday night. What did you do Saturday night? Uh, what did you do last night? How late did you stay up? Were, was it easy for you to get up this morning, or did you have trouble? I dare say there were some people who wanted to come to church today, but because of what they did last night, they didn't quite make it out of bed in time to be here today, this morning. I'm just hazarding a guess. But. How it goes with our families, the kinds of activities or... Uh, uh, things that we engage ourselves in, all of those impact our readiness to hear from God and to be moved by God. Maybe you did have a light, late night last night, and you are here this morning, but uh, uh, you're barely staying awake. All right, I'm not looking. Uh, I'm not looking at who's falling asleep out there, and I know there's all kinds of reasons and, and that, but uh, the point is this, that preparing to receive something from God goes beyond just being here this morning. There are other things in our lives that we have to take care of, and we have to make sure that we humble ourselves before God and get right with God in order to be ready to hear from Him. And this is true whether we come to Sunday morning service or whether we're doing our devotion or anything. We have to get right with God. So God's going to use our minds, God's going to use our emotions, but it has to be spiritually founded for it to have the long-lasting impact. And we're going to see that as we go on. And that brings us to our, our uh, next point here for verse 1. To be our, our first point, be reminded to act is this, do something about it. Peter is not saying, hey, look, I'm reminding you of this, just so that they'll hear it and say, yeah, you know, that sounds really good. And uh, thank you, Peter, for reminding us. He, he is reminding them with the intent that they are going to act on it, that they are going to do something about it. This has been, I mean, this is the whole ex exhortation of Scripture. 
Paul writes his epistle or Peter writes his epistle and he's trying to show the believers this and he shows the believers that and he shows the believers, you know, all of these things and he encourages them to the, towards what God wants for them. And when we hear the ex exhortation or when we read the exhortation from Scripture, there is the need to do something about it. We are to be reminded and, and when, we, when we have that moment, ah, yeah, I remember that then we act upon it afterwards. So if we study in Sunday school that we're supposed to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, well, you know, that's being reminded of it, so now what are we going to do? We should leave with that thought in our mind, looking towards our neighbor for the opportunities to minister and to serve them in their lives. That's acting upon it. That's why we're being reminded, so that we will do something about it. And so if we're told, don't do this sin, well, then we need to act upon this. Or we need to start doing this devotion, then we need to act upon it and put it into the process of our lives. Then God will be able to do much more in our lives. So we come to the second point then this morning, and it is this, remember the word. Now we've already seen this, Peter has reminded us several times in 1 Peter and in 2 Peter about the importance of the Word of God, and he is going to do this one more time as he goes into this third chapter here and addressing this criticism by the world against Christianity. He starts off by reminding them to remember his word. So here it is, verse 2, he says that you may be mindful of the words. There it is again. He, he's, he's bringing out the idea again to be mindful of the words uh, which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So there are several things. There's the being mindful. There's these words that were spoken. They were spoken by the prophets and the apostles. You have these holy prophets and you have the commandment. The commandment of the apostles, the commandment of us, the apostles. So a lot of things here concerning the word of God in this verse. So first of all, there is an affirmation here of the Old Testament and the New Testament. He says, be mindful of the words that were spoken by the prophets, that's the Old Testament, and the apostles, that's the New Testament. It is all of the word of God, all the word of God. All of these books from Genesis to Revelation, this is the word of God. Now I know, you know, if you've tried to read through Leviticus, it's like, oh my goodness. And then you try to read through Ezra, and you have all of those names, it's like, oh my goodness. Why is this in here? As a matter of fact, somebody sent me a, a text, they were reading the first a few chapters of First Chronicles. So the first 10 chapters of First Chronicles is all names and genealogies. And they're saying, am I missing something? Why was this given to us? Why am I reading this? Half of these names I can't pronounce. It's just so difficult. And so a lot of times there is this tendency to turn away from the Old Testament. And we must be careful not to do that. Now we're reading the 5 by 5 by 5 which is taking us through the New Testament in one year. We did this last year and a number of you participated in that. And, and uh, we're doing it again. We have the sheets on the back table there. And it's not too late uh, for you to join in. As a matter of fact, the, the, the whole purpose is, is not to be able to tick off while I've read the New Testament. The purpose is to get us into the Word of God on a daily basis and to think about what we're reading. Now, that's, that's, the, that's one of the main purposes there. And um, so if you don't start right away, I mean, we're in March now, and that's okay. Um, I think I'm still in January reading. I'm trying to, me and Stephen and, and uh, Micah, we're trying to, to do it ourselves. And so we're way behind, but we're not letting that bother us. We're going to, you know, keep on going through. Now, some of you who finished the New Testament last year, you had asked me as we were getting ready to, to start this new year if there was an equivalent Old Testament one. And um, that's really encouraging. And so some of you, there are a few of you out there who are doing the Old Testament this year as opposed to the New Testament, and that's wonderful. We must not neglect the Old Testament. Here in the ministry of the church, during uh, the course of the Sunday morning service, I will preach through the New Testament or a New Testament book. That's, that's why I've been doing that for years. But every time I, 
uh, almost every sermon that I preach, I make reference to something in the Old Testament. So you'll hear me quote from the Old Testament. On Sunday nights or Wednesday nights, I will study the, the Old Testament. We'll do an Old Testament book in a, instead of a New Testament book. So on Wednesday nights right now, we're doing the book of Daniel on Wednesday nights. And on Sunday nights, when I usually do an Old Testament devotion, we're doing the book of Revelation. So uh, by Sunday morning and Wednesday night and Sunday night, we, we are expanding the, the exposure to the Word of God because it is all the Word of God. And I tell you what, with three short hours a week, it is very hard to cover all of this information here. But we do the best that we can. And we encourage uh, ourselves in the Word of God. This is what remembering the Word is all about. It is trying to get the whole counsel of God to take it all in. And part of your devotions and your daily reading and the listening of the sermons and the messages and all of that is to get you into as much of the Word of God as is possible because it is all the Word of God. We must remember its truths because it is those truths that change our lives and uh, allow us to experience the blessings of God and enables us to glorify him. So we have the Old Testament and the New Testament, the prophets and the apostles. And this is part of our remembering of the word of God. The next thing here, of course, he is uh, talking about remembering it, to be mindful of. The word means to recall, to remember, to call attention to. The word be mindful of or to remember. It is to give careful consideration. It is to think about what it is that comes to your mind from the word of God and to put your attention or your focus upon it. So take it to heart and be active about it. Just a simple uh, ex example here is found in Luke chapter 24, verses 6 through 8. Jesus had risen from the dead and they went to the tomb in order to find him, and, he said, and it says here, he is not here, but is risen. So here it is, the word, remember. Remember, remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. So they are confronted with him having risen from the dead, but they had forgotten that he had already told them this was going to happen. And so they're being reminded of it, and they remember it. And so this is how it goes with us. We come to a passage here. Now, now you know, you should have your Bibles. You, you really should have your Bibles. I know I put the, the verses on the screen a lot of time. But uh, you really should have your Bibles. Why? You have your pen in your hand. And uh, I'm going to give you permission now to, to write in your Bibles. It is okay to write in your Bible. I would encourage that. Uh, I used to read, I used to be afraid to write in any book. And I, and I didn't want to mess up the book. So whenever I read a book, I would read it like this. So that I wouldn't put a crease in the, you know, in the spine here. And God forbid that I would write any mark in the Bible. Still now... If my pencil slides and I put a mark on the page, I, I go find the best eraser I can to erase that mark. I mean, it just bothers me for some reason. But it shouldn't. It's okay. Write in your Bible. Now, get a highlighter and highlight the important words. Make a note next to them. I, now I read all my books like that. I have a pencil in hand. If I have a stack of books that I'm reading, and they all have a pencil inside as a bookmark and so that I'm ready to write a note or a comment or something next to what I read. That's active reading. Um, but when it comes to the Bible, it is active reading and remembering. Uh, write in your Bible, highlight the important words, um, mark the things that the Lord shows you as you're reading through it. Remember. So be mindful of what you read. Remember these words because they are life. Colin read... From the 5 by 5 from Hebrews chapter 4, that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It is not just a book. This is God's word to us, and it is powerful. 
The third thing here is still, it is still relevant. It is still relevant today. So when Peter says, be mindful of the words that were spoken by the prophets and the apostles, there is this tendency, or one of the things that we might think of is that, well, it's in the Old Testament, it no longer applies to me, there are all these laws and all of these names, and it's no longer applicable to me, but this is not what Peter is saying here. He says this specifically, be mindful of the words which were spoken before. Now, one of your translations says the predictions, and it leaves out the were spoken, and I don't understand either of those at all, but this is what it says, the words which were spoken before. This is in the perfect tense. Now in Greek what this means is, is that it was, it was something that happened in the past whose impact continues to the present. That's the perfect tense. The, it was something that happened in the past, the book was written, but the impact continues, the state continues to this day. So what this means is they the prophets wrote their words in the past, but they still have ongoing impact for us today. So this is another reason why we just cannot put aside the Old Testament. It was written in the past, yes, but it is still relevant for us today. It is so relevant, as a matter of fact, going back to the New Testament writers, that when Jesus came to this earth, especially if you read through the Gospel of Matthew, he quotes one quote after another quote from Isaiah, who was 700 years before the coming of Christ, and he shows how what Isaiah wrote still had relevant impact for the life of Christ back then. And the words of the prophet continue to carry their impact for us today. You can, uh, we go out of the Gospels, we go into Paul's writings, and he's quoting the Old Testament, and Peter's telling us here to remember the things that were spoken before by the prophets, because they have relevance for us today. And you can be really blessed if you read through the, the text of the Bible. It is the living Word of God. And then finally, he's, uh, well, not finally, but the next point here is that he, notice how he says the holy prophets. And this is because he's been talking about what kind of prophets? The false prophets. So the pro false prophets are doing all this and leading you astray, but the holy prophets, they wrote God's word for the impact of our, our Christianity today, the holy prophets. And then the last one here, the commandments of the apostles, the commandments of the apostles. Uh, I, I, I think the idea of following commandments for us, our New Testament sensibilities has kind of fallen by the wayside. We are to be mindful of the commandments of the apostles. Now, there is one great commandment, and that is the commandment to love. That's the great commandment. But look, we are not out from under the responsibility and the duty of following the precepts of Scripture in our lives. It is there and it is present, and we must strive to do what is right, and we must strive to, do, to stay away from the things that are wrong. That is, the, that is the heart of the Christian battle. It is a battle. And we should strive. I mean, it, it, it's not about whether or not we're going to be saved. I am saved, and a person is saved only by faith in Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus. Please forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. And that brings about the salvation in my life. It is not about works. It is by faith alone. But once I accept Christ as my Savior, well, now I have a life to live for him and it matters how I live. I am to live this life that he has given me with all of my strength, striving to be the best servant I can possibly be. It's like you get a new job, all right? So you go, you go to the interview, and the interview determines whether you have the job or not. But once you get that job, you have to work there, and you have to be the best employee that you can possibly be, right? 
Now, I'm not going to say if, you, if you're a bad employee, you're going to lose your job, and if you're a bad Christian, you're going to lose your salvation. I don't believe that. But the point here is this, that once I accept Christ as my Savior, I now am his servant, and my desire ought to be to be the best servant possible in this life. And there are, there's this reminder here to be mindful, to remember the commandments of the apostles. Remember the commandments of the apostles and let it impact your life. Now, as we come to the scripture, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. This is John chapter 7, verse 16. And this is the progression of the impact of revelation upon our lives. So, so this is how we take the word of God as we continue on uh, through our life as Christians. First, we see what Jesus says here. Now, here comes Jesus. He comes and he lives on this earth, and he is continuing to speak the revelation of the Father. He says, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. So the Father who sent Jesus' the Son in his incarnation gives Jesus his doctrine, his teaching, and he teaches it out to the people. So it's through Jesus. And then we come to this passage in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Now, now Paul is writing to the church. So you have Jesus who comes and he, he is kind of the initial um, proclaimer of the, the truth of God. So then you come to the church here, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. It says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So he's talking about us as Christians. Having been built on the foundation of the what? You see that there? Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. There it is. The Old and the New Testament. And then, of course, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So there has been this foundation given to us as believers in Christ that rests upon the word of God, as it has come to us by Jesus, by the prophets, and by the apostles. Now, this continues as we go through into the ministry of the church, and this becomes even more relevant to us. This is what we're uh, what we attempt to do when we come together. So this is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 15. He himself, as Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Look, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of the deceitful, of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Now, going back to the verse 11 again, th this is really important. This is critical. This is what the church is all about. It is about the gifts of Christ to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Now, whenever two or three believers come together, their Christ is in the midst. And so there is the need and the necessity for us as believers to come together. And whenever we come together, Christ is there, of course. When I go into my closet, Christ is there because I am a believer in him. And so this is, this is important. But our gatherings together don't necessarily constitute a church. A church is the assembling of the people of God under the headship of these people that God has put in charge of the church or in the operation of the fulfillment of the church. So a family, it is really important for a family to get together and to have their devotions and to pray and to read the Bible, this is important for a family. And the father, as the head of the family, is responsible for the gathering of the family together. And the family should do this, but a family getting together is not a church. It is a family. Instead, 
or in addition to that, the families, we all come together and we congregate here to worship God. This is a church. And so it is indispensable for us, it is necessary for us to, to come together for the ministry of the Word of God and for the ministry of service, for the edific edification of the body, it is necessary for us to come together and to congregate in his name under the leadership that he has given. And then it comes to us as individuals. And so here, Peter, and we've already looked at some of these in recent weeks, he says, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word. So the word comes through Jesus. It is founded on the prophets and the apostles through Jesus. It is cultivated in the life of the church, and I take it home with me like a baby takes his milk, and I grow by it. And the assumption is, going back to why Peter is reminding, is that we will be doers of the word and not hearers only. The purpose, is, the purpose of being reminded is that I will put it in practice. I will make some change in my life. Now, uh, now this is my encouragement to us as we, as we uh, hear it this morning. The encouragement is take something. Take something that you have been reminded of from the Word of God and start to make this plan in your mind as to how you can make it uh, active in your life and make those kinds of adjustments and modifications to your life to begin to act upon the Word that you have been reminded of. This is, the ongoing, this is the ongoing lesson of the Word of God, that we are reminded of it, and then we go put it into practice in our lives. So what kind of change can you make in your life? What kind of thing can you do? Maybe it's just simply giving more attention to the Word of God. Maybe it is starting to read the Old Testament a little bit more. And I'll tell you what, if you want to read the, the book of Psalms, that is a great place to uh, go to because you will be able to engage with the passions of the psalmist almost immediately. Proverbs is full of wisdom, and so you can uh, read through the book of Proverbs and, and gain all kinds of wisdom for life. You can read the book of Genesis, and you can read the other portions of Scripture and be encouraged by the examples of those who have lived in the past seeing the things that they experienced and seeing their faith in the midst of it. So maybe that's, maybe that's your takeaway this morning, but whatever it is, take what God is showing you, take what God is reminding you of it, and make some adjustment into your life. You will be blessed by it, and God will be glorified by it. And this is what Peter is hoping to do. He is not just writing it for his own amusement here. He is writing to remind them, and he encourages them to be mindful of it and to remember it. It is the foundation by which we live. And this is going to be really important as we move into the attacks of the world against the truth of Scripture. We want to be pre prepared. We want to be ready. We want to know how to handle these attacks because there are people out there that are attacking the foundations of Christianity and we don't know what to, to think about that. We don't know how to respond. And this is what Peter is going to show us how to do. And let me just say as we go forward, there is not a single question that we need to be afraid of that a critic can throw at us. Not a single one. So don't be afraid of their questions. But it might mean having to build up yourself a little bit in the faith so that you can stand against the question or, if nothing else, not be rattled by the question. There are answers. There are answers, specific and truth-filled answers, that do not even budge the foundation of our faith in God. Not even a little bit. So that's where we're headed, Lord willing, in the, the days to come. This morning... So far, verses 1 and 2, and here are our two points. Again, be reminded to act 
and remember the word. So this is where we leave this morning. As we sing our final song up here, if there is, uh, I would encourage you that this morning you take at least one thing that God has reminded you of and you uh, commit it to him. Oh Lord, thank you for showing me this. Thank you for reminding me this. Now show me what I can do in my life to make the adjustments that are honoring to you. Just take that to the Lord this morning as we sing our final song of worship here. And if you want prayer, of course, you can come up front. Let's stand as we sing our last song.